All right, welcome to the uh, online causal inference seminar today. We're very excited to have Corwin Siegler from the University of Texas at Austin. We'll talk about bipartite inference and air pollution transport estimation health effects of power plant interventions. Uh, in Q&A, we have uh, two collaborators, Laura Forestier and Fabrizio Miali, who are happy to uh, answer uh, your questions. After the talk, we'll have a discussion by Forrest Crawford from Yale. Uh, questions today will be handled by Michael, so I'm quickly switching over to him. Uh, thanks, Dominic. So uh, as Dominic said, we have Laura Forestiere and uh, Fabrizio Miali helping with uh, questions today, so we're very lucky to have them. So uh, submit all your uh, questions. Uh, Corwin will also stop from time to time to uh, take some questions live, so we may ask you to um, whether you'd like to ask your question live. Um, uh, and uh, keep in mind that the uh, talk is being recorded if you if you choose to ask your question live. Uh, so with that, uh, Corwin, please uh, start whenever you're ready. Oh, you're. I think you're still muted. Oh, give me a moment. Am I still muted? No, no, no. We can't. Okay, good. Sorry, I lost my controls there in the full screen. Okay. Um, well, thank you everybody uh, for coming. I'm really excited to have a chance to share some of this work with a group like this. Um, so what I was planning to do here was give an overview of, of really a handful of different papers all under this heading of, of causal inference with uh, bipartite causal inference with interference with a focus on, on work evaluating health impacts of power plant regulations. So I'll give um, a little bit of a high level view of a handful of things, hopefully try and place this work in the sort of causal inference literature and then towards the end get to a more specific uh, causal inference uh, analysis of, of this particular problem. So I'll start by outlining or trying to outline the motivating problem here, which is that air pollution is bad for you um, which is something that you might know. Um, there's a big world of science about this, but the type of pollution that, that will be the focus, at least in this talk, is PM 2.5 over here, fine particulate matter. So just think of these as very small particles that are small enough to get in your lungs and, and penetrate various things and, and, and make us sick. Um, but I, my work is actually not about how air pollution is bad for us. I think an audience like this, the distinction between talking about the causal effects of pollution exposure versus the causal effects of some intervention is probably a distinction that makes sense. So when I got into this work, uh, the, the state of the science sort of said, well, we know that this type of pollution, PF2.5, is associated with increased health burden, but there are lots of questions that could be sort of informally summed up as, well, what can we do about it? And so we have uh, a, a variety of questions surrounding the effectiveness of specific regulatory actions for improving air quality and, and improving public health. And again, this distinction that should resonate with a, an audience like this is there's a difference between saying, what are the causal effects of pollution exposure and saying, well, what are the causal effects of interventions implemented to control air pollution? And so my work is focused on interventions at, at what turns out to be one key source of air pollution, which is uh, coal-fired power plants. So to continue to fix the ideas here, here's just a picture of a coal-fired power plant. And the idea is that there are lots of different regulations to limit pollution from this type of power plant. Um, but the basic idea here is lots of things come out of the smokestack of a coal-fired power plant as a byproduct of, of coal combustion. Uh, some of these particles come out, but this actually turns out not to be the biggest problem with pollution from coal-fired power plants. Well, the biggest problem is what's located, what's, what's denoted in this picture up here is what's called secondary PM 2.5 formation, which is to say that some of these other chemicals come out of the coal-fired, uh, of, of the smokestack of the power plant. For example, SO2, which is a gas. And after it comes out of the smokestack, it blows around in the wind, it reacts with other things in the atmosphere, and some long, somewhere along the line, it, it converts into these particles uh, that are then breathed in by people and, and, and make them sick. And this is what's called secondary PM 2.5 formation, and this becomes is gonna become a very important part of this problem we're trying to solve. So the idea again at a high level here is uh, 
Some of these uh, coal-fired power plants install what are called scrubbers uh, in response to federal regulation. So these are things that you can think of as scrubbing the SO2 out of the smoke uh, before it goes out into the atmosphere. But the idea here is that installing one of these scrubbers, we know it will reduce SO2 emissions. And so the idea is that reduced SO2 emissions leads to reduced secondary formation of PM2.5, less ambient pollution in the air, and some improvement in health. That's kind of the overall rationale here. Um, and so this type of specific question that, that we'll answer as we get towards the end of the talk is, do scrubbers on coal-fired power plants causally affect hospitalizations for ischemic heart disease among Medicare beneficiaries? So I have here on the left a movie, if it works, which I hope folks can see, which is going to, again, it's a little bit of a, it's a little cartoonish, but it'll fix kind of the ideas. But the idea here is that this red dot in northwestern Georgia here is the location of a coal-fired power plant. And the idea is that emissions that come out of that power plant move. And they actually move, as you can see in the, in the video on the left, they move quite a long distance, or they can move quite a long distance. And somewhere along the line, they're going to convert into these particles that we know are bad for human health. So at least in principle, intervening at this red dot uh, could impact the air pollution and the health of anybody who lives in a part of the country where this cloud of purple and greenish points are floating over. Um, and so this is, again, just to give you an idea of kind of the spatial scale of this type of problem. And this is what's going to give rise to us trying to make inference on a network of interconnected power plants and, and population locations, which is what's going to give rise to what we know in the statistics literature as, as interference. So we're not going to do an analysis like this one power plant at a time. What we really have is uh, something on the order of hundreds of power plants, coal-fired power plants located across the United States, some of them install these scrubbers and some of them don't. And we want to know how those scrubber installations affect health measured at population locations, which we measured at postal codes, at zip codes in the US here. Um, so there's uh, about 30,000 of those across uh, the United States. And so that's the sort of very high level setup. Um, I can pause here if anyone has questions on the, on the sort of background. I don't believe we have any okay. questions yet, so just go on. So we started to think about how, how would we formulate a problem like this with potential outcomes. And we found ourselves in what I called, what I referred to earlier as the setting of bipartite causal inference with interference. So here are the, the defining characteristics of what I mean by that. So say we're interested in evaluating causal effects of a, in this case, a binary intervention where we're confronted with two features. One is what I've called a bipartite structure where we have an intervention that's defined on one type of observational unit. Here, whether a, whether a power plant installs one of these scrubbers or doesn't. And then the outcomes are interested are defined and measured on some other distinct type of observational unit. Here, we're gonna be looking at hospitalization outcome, hospitalizations uh, measured at residential zip codes. So there, there's nothing particularly um, unique about this type of bipartite setting. I think this comes up all the time. We're gonna combine it though with the notion of interference, which is to say that there's gonna be some notion of interconnectedness between these two different types of units so that outcomes for a particular unit depend on treatments assigned to multiple other units. And that's, how, that's what we'll formalize with this structure of interference. And so the first type of observational unit we call the interventional units, they're gonna be indexed by J in this talk. These are power plants in the example. These are where, where interventions occur or don't occur. And so SJ for scrubber will be the binary indicator of whether the Jth power plant installs a scrubber or does not install a scrubber. And we'll have a vector, sort of treatment allocation vector to all capital J interventional units um, in the sample. And then we will have uh, covariates, which will be denoted with the superscript INT for, for interventional unit covariates that might be measured at as characteristics of the interventional unit, so like features of the power plant in this case. The, the other type of, of unit we'll call outcome units. They're going to be indexed by I in this talk. Um, these are where the outcomes will be measured and what we're interested in it, it will be measured and denoted with Y to be something like the observed hospitalization rate at the I zip code. And then we'll have a separate set of covariates denoted thusly, uh, that will be features of the outcome units, features of the zip code. Think of like population demographics and things like that. 
And so, you know, this is a point that I don't think I need to belabor too much for an audience like this, but we know um, that in the sort of standard setting of potential outcomes formulation, we would make something like the stable unit treatment value assumption to say that the potential outcomes for the ith unit only depend on the ith unit's treatment. And that would give us this sort of familiar framing of saying there are exactly two potential outcomes for each unit, and we can estimate something like an average causal effect or define something like an average causal effect. Um, the, the point here is when we have this bipartite structure and interference, of course, the stable unit treatment value assumption won't, uh, is an assumption we, we want to make, make in this case. And so we say that the potential outcome for the ith outcome unit is actually in full generality, at least full indexed by this vector of treatments at all J power plants. And so the thing that's uh, you know, notationally different here um, than, than what would be the more typical setting is that Y here is indexed by I, but the, the treatment vector inside the potential outcomes is of dimension J, um, which is different than dimension N, which is the number of outcome units. We'll make all this a little bit more clear. But the basic idea here, of course, now is that for every uh, outcome unit, we have two to the power J unique potential outcomes and we need to do something uh, to make this a tractable uh, inference problem. So again, just to give an idea of the spatial scale, if we outline a zip code here, this is the zip code outside Boston, we could say with methods that I'll talk about in a little bit, that the potential outcome at, uh, the potential hospitalization rate in Boston or outside Boston is actually a function of the treatment statuses of all 278 of these power plants. So in principle, intervening on any of these 278 power plants might impact the hospitalization rate um, at that location. Again, this is just to give you an idea of the, of the scale we're talking about here. So at least for those of you who, who think a lot about problems of interference, um, uh, I hope this resonates as, as a, a sort of interference phenomenon that's a little bit different from how it's, I think, most of, often been considered in the statistics literature. So the, at least historically, the most common settings we're used to thinking about are infectious disease settings and social networks, um, where we have units that are organized into an adjacency matrix. And, and the phenomenon that dictates the interference is this, what I've called here is this unit to unit outcome dependency. If I get a vaccine, I'm less likely to get infected, which means I'm less likely to infect my friends. Um, but it's the dependent outcomes that give rise to the interference. And this is something that I think at least could be described as topological interference. The power plant setting here, um, hopefully you've identified as a little bit different. The way that, that I've chosen to describe it is to say that the interference here is not because of dependent outcomes here. It's because of some complex exposure dependencies that are built into this problem. And so in this case, interference is dictated by an underlying physical chemical process that is sort of the, the movement of air pollution in time and space. Uh, and so this is a setting that, that I think is closer to a notion of like treatment diffusion. Um, and it's one that for the purposes of, of distinction, uh, I, I've referred to as physical or, or maybe geographical interference as something that's distinct from uh, sort of topological notion of interference. And so I'll, I'll take a little bit of a detour here to talk about sort of what we've been doing. How do we obtain this type of um, network structure or how do we characterize this type of, of interference? But I'll pause here in case folks have questions about the basic potential outcomes framing. Uh, we, we still don't have any questions, so you can move on. Okay. So if we think about how we wanna encode the information about the interference in this case, we can think about uh, an adjacency matrix here, which will be denoted in the talk with capital T here, which is a matrix that is dimension J by N. So we have, you can think of it as power plants along the rows here and, and zip codes along the columns here, where the, the elements of this, the internal elements of this matrix will be some sort of measure of influence of the jth power plant on the ith location. And so this is something that in, in atmospheric engineering would be called a source receptor matrix. And so we have this question, so how do we obtain something like this for this type of problem? Um, so the, which gives rise to what I think is another distinction that's worth pointing out. Again, hopefully will resonate with, with folks who are used to thinking about problems of interference or networks. Um, 
the, I'd say the typical, or maybe I shouldn't say typical, but the, the, the um, context that I think has most historic, appeared most historically in the statistics literature is something like the notion of a social network here, where we have this adjacency matrix and we say two people interfere if they report being friends. You do a study, you ask people who they're friends with, and if two people report being friends, um, an entry, the corresponding entry of that matrix is equal to zero. That's sort of a simplistic view of it. But the point I'm trying to make here is that in that case, the, the, the uh, adjacency matrix, the interference structure or the network structure is part of the data collection process. You do a study to ask people who they're friends with would be uh, uh, sort of a, an example. In, in the power plant context, we have interference here, remember, is, is governed by the dynamics of this physical chemical process of pollution transport. So the first thing to note is we're going to be thinking about a weighted adjacency matrix because there's some continuous notion of strength of connection between two nodes, uh, between a power plant and a location. So this will be a, a weighted bipartite adjacency matrix. But the point here is we need to model, um, or at least in this problem, we needed to model uh, what this interference structure is actually supposed to look like. And so I think there's this distinction between whether we're going to collect data on the network versus we're going to have to actually model the network um, because it does it's not lying around for somebody to give to us. And so to zoom out and, and give a, a little bit of a, a very sort of coarse outline of what, what we're thinking of doing here is, is the process here we can think of in, in sort of three steps. We're going to have to characterize the structure of the interference for this problem. Once we do that, then we have to develop some statistical methods for causal inference for a network of that structure. And then we'll use that to estimate causal effects. But the point I'm trying to make here is that there's this sort of this bifurcation to say, well, we're gonna collect data on the network and then plug that in to statistical methods for causal inference, or are there, are there problems, and I, I think there are, where we're gonna to have to model the network ourselves in order to do this. Um, and so that's really where the direction we had to go when we started pursuing this work. So we needed a model for the network. And then there was this further bifurcation to say, okay, do we do a statistical model for this network and propagate the uncertainty in the network into the estimation of causal effects? That's of course what, as a statistician, that's what we thought of first, that's what I thought of first. Um, or are we gonna take a more engineering approach uh, to model this network? And so I wanna say a little bit more about that. Um, so we had this question, how are we gonna model the interference in a problem like this? The statistical approach says, well, we have data on the power plant emissions, on the ambient pollution, we have data on wind vectors, weather, we have a lot of data for a problem like this. So, you know, the statistician in me says, in principle, we should be able to estimate where the pollution is going. If emissions go up here, pollution should go up there, and we should be able to disentangle this. Um, and, and an atmospheric engineer will think you're crazy. And I, uh, I had many atmospheric engineers when I got into this say, you cannot do this statistically um, the system is just too complex, which I, of course, took as a challenge. Um, but they're not entirely wrong. It is a very complex system. And they're, the, the, I think the role of kind of a purely statistical approach to doing this is, is not that clear, um, at least not that I know of. And so that um, the, the sort of difficulties here led us to also pursue a more engineering first approach, which is to say that well, there's an entire field of atmospheric and environmental engineer. They have lots of complicated physical and chemical models for this pollution processes. They don't really have, they didn't really have anything in that field that was quite right for this use case for our purposes. Um, but we were able to kind of repurpose some of those tools uh, to do what we what we needed them to do, um, and and made a lot of progress with that approach. And so uh, I want to just say a couple uh, things about ongoing work we have to do the kind of statistics first approach to actually model this. This is really just to get the keywords up on the slide. Um, so we have some work, this is really being led by Nathan Weichel and Ephraim Hanks, uh, collaborators at Penn State, to do some space-time dynamic, dynamic processes to sort of statistically model this pollution diffusion. This is showing a lot of promise. Um, and then with a student here at UT, uh, we have a more kind of machine learning first approach going that uses some kind of specifically tailored convolutional neural networks to try and do this. It's also showing a little bit of promise. Um, but again, this is just to kind of give two examples of the types of methods we've been exploring to, to address this. None of these things are, are quite done and we have not fully realized their potential for these causal inference problems I'll talk about in a, in a minute, which took us to 
uh, where we have made a lot more progress is with these uh, more engineering focused approaches to obtaining the interference network. So we can play our movie here again. Um, and so we do, and, and what this movie is, is a representation of this model that we, we developed that's called the high split average dispersion model, the details of which um, uh, I don't think we need to get into right now, but, but the basic idea, these kind of discrete clouds of points you see coming out of the power plant in the movie, these are simulated emissions events where hundred air parcels start at a smokestack. Um, and then those parcels are dispersed according to historical weather data and they're tracked forward in time for some, for some period. And that's what this video is showing. And so then what we do is, is we align all of those dispersed parcels in time and space with zip codes. So we can come up with some sort of notion of in a given zip code, how often is the pollution from a given power plant sort of blowing over this zip code. Um, there's a front end uh, uh, R package to actually do this. This is an, an example of what's called an atmospheric science, a reduced complexity model, which sort of intentionally sacrifices some of the complexity, some of the physics and the, and the chemistry uh, for something that was computationally scalable for, for this purpose. And so um, this is really a whole separate talk and how we did this. But if, if people are interested, this paper by Henneman et al. in atmospheric environment is sort of the, the most detailed description of what this model actually does. Um, and it validates it against various other um, engineering approaches. But anyway, to get back to the problem of this adjacency matrix, we have this, uh, we have this sort of quantity that will summarize the structure of the interference in this problem, which is a weighted bipartite adjacency matrix, where we, we're going to do is take, is I'd say enter the entries of this matrix based on the output from that atmospheric model that the video was showing. So we can think of every of the ji entry of this matrix being something like the number of times parcels air dispersed from power plant J passes over location I. So this is just to say, according to this roadmap, we're all the way on the right here. We're in a setting where we had to model the, the structure of the network as part of the investigation. And for the rest of this talk, I'm going to talk about everything will be based on this sort of engineering type model, um, which will then plug into the statistical methods development uh, that I'll talk about now. So I'll pause again in case folks have questions about this. Um, sure, yeah, we just received a question from uh, Richard Burke, uh, who asks, what about uncertainty in the atmospheric physics, uh, for example, turbulence? Yes. So I would say there's no, the, the, this type of engineering first approach does not have an account of uncertainty that would be compelling to a statistician, right? These are deterministic models. The sort of, there's sort of a brute forced account of uncertainty that says, if you do this enough time, the uncertainty sort of, you know, comes out in the end. Um, you can decide whether that's compelling or not. I'm not particularly compelled by that, which is why we're still pursuing these statistics first approach where we would get a, a formal account of uncertainty. Okay, maybe uh, maybe go on for now. Go on. Yeah, thanks. So uh, back to the potential outcome. So just to remind uh, everyone where we were here, we have the potential outcome for the ith outcome unit is going to be indexed by the whole vector of treatment assignments to the j interventional units here, uh, where uh, the binary indicator sj is whether there's a scrubber or not installed on the j power plant. And I'll use this minus J notation here to denote the treatment assignment of all the power plants except the J power plant. So if we start to anticipate the types of causal estimates that come up in the interference literature, we can write down the most primitive individual level causal effect uh, as written here on the screen, which is the, the, the effect on outcome unit I of a treatment allocation S with J element equal to lowercase s, compared against treatment allocation S prime with J element of S prime equal to lowercase S prime. So the, the reason I'm writing it here is to, is to point out sort of a key feature of this or a key consequence of this bipartite structure is that if we write down something like an individual level causal effect like this, for every I, there are J, capital J of these effects, because this is jointly indexed by the outcome unit I and the, and the interventional unit J. And so we can see right here that there's no self-evident notion here of any particular uh, 
interventional unit that directly applies to an outcome unit, as would be the case in sort of a one unit setting where, it's, where uh, the notion of a direct treatment is, is usually clear. And so- uh, hey, Cor uh, Corin, yes. can, I, can I actually jump in with a question? Please, yeah. Uh, so we have a question from uh, Michael Hudgens. He asks, could you clarify the difference between topological interference and geographical interference? Um, maybe, yes. Uh, so that's a good question. So that's a distinction that I'm sort of offering um, to distinguish between uh, interference that is due to dependent dependencies among the outcomes, like in an infectious disease or how it's usually characterized in a social network, that's what I would call topological interference. Whereas geographical or physical interference is where those interrelationships are not because of dependencies among the outcomes of units, they're due to some other sort of complicated exposure dynamics in this case. Uh, I don't, I don't have a more formal definition than that, Michael. Um, that's just a, a distinction that I found useful in, in labeling these things. Okay, thanks. Yeah, maybe go on. Okay. So we have some work that, that, that addresses this problem from a more general uh, perspective, but in this talk, I'll focus on what we've called the key associated causal effects in a bipartite setting, which is to say, if we write down a potential outcome like this, this is something in the bipartite setting that's defined for every IJ pair of um, I indexing the outcome unit, J indexing the interventional unit. Um, what I'll do is proceed with development where we consider for each I, for each outcome unit, a particular power plant of interest. So you can think of this as like the closest power plant to that location. Um, we won't actually use the closest, we'll use something, some notion of the most influential. But the idea here is for every zip code, we identify one power plant that is a particular interest and we call that the key associated power plant. And we're gonna denote that with J star here. And then what we do is we say, well, we don't, for every outcome unit I, we don't actually necessarily care about writing down the potential outcome for, in this way for every IJ pair. We're really gonna focus on the potential outcome core that calls out the treatment status of just the key associated power plant. So something like we, we think about quantities like the potential outcome for a zip code if the key associated plant had a given treat, treat, treatment status and all other plants had some other allocation. And so with that type of definition, we can start to formulate this problem following a lot of Laura's previous work, Fabrizio's previous work and, and, and others. We can start to formulate this problem as sort of a bivariate treatment problem to where we say the first component of the treatment is something that is sort of like the individual level treatment, which we'll call the key associated treatment which will be the treat for every outcome unit, the treatment of the key associated power plant. And so that'll be denoted with ZI, which is just the treatment status of the J star power plant. Where J star here is just defined as the maximum row value of that inter, uh, interference, that, that weighted adjacency matrix, it's directly output from that high ads atmospheric model. And so again, ZI will be the scrubber status of the most influential plant um, the plant that is most influential to the i zip code. The other component of the treatment, which is something like a neighborhood level treatment or might be called that in a network case, we'll call it the upwind treatment, is this function of the treatment statuses of all the other power, all the up, quote unquote upwind power plants. That's gonna be denoted here with G, which is this uh, sort of rescaled uh, weighted average of the treatment status of all the other power plants that's weighted according to the entries of this adjacency matrix. And so this is very similar to the idea of an exposure mapping that's appeared um, elsewhere in this type of literature. So we can think of this upwind treatment rate as something like the high ads weighted rate of scrubbers installed upwind. And so if we just pause to think about it for a second, this uh, quantity G there are, you know, you can think of many ways that this quantity G could be high versus low. So G could be high if there are a small number of very influential power plants to that location that have that were treated. Two very large power plants, both with scrubbers. G could also be high if there are many power plants upwind from that, many small power plants upwind from that 
um, zip code. Maybe they're located far away, but they're all treated. So it could sort of be a small number of very influential power plants with treatments or a large number of weekly influential power plants that are treated. Those are sort of two things that could in principle give the same value of G here. And so with that bivariate, bivariate formulation of the treatment, we can make what we call an upwind interference assumption. This is a sort of uh, kind of the major assumption that's an adaptation of, of, of SUDFA here, which is essentially informally says all of the interference in this problem kind of flows through this key associated treatment and this particular function of the upwind treatments. So that's what's written out here. We just say the potential outcomes under two different treatment allocations are the same whenever the key associated treatment and um, this upwind treatment function are the same. So hospitalizations are the same for a given location under two different allocations of scrubbers to the power plant. Whenever the key associated power plant, uh, the key associated treatment and this upwind treatment rate are the same. And again, this is really sort of the key assumption about interference that's made in order to get, uh, to get this off the ground. So there are a couple notes here uh, that I want to make, and again, it, it, this may resonate if, if this is a particular corner of the literature you followed carefully, is we have this notion of an individual treatment, or really we call the key associated treatment here, which is denoted with Z, the scrubber status of the most influential power plant for a location. But there's a point here that not every element of S appears is represented in Z. That is, there are power plants in the sample that are not key associated to any zip code. It's sort of a subtle point, but the reason it's important is because when we think about the neighborhood treatment here, G, this is a function of all the power plants, except the J starth one in the notation, which means that there are power plants that are not represented in Z at all because they're not key associated to any zip code, but they can dictate the value of G. They're still blowing stuff into the air. That stuff still might blow over a given location. And sort of the implication for this is that in this problem, and this is a distinction with how these things have been formulated previously, is there is variability in this upwind treatment that is sort of, in a sense, independent from the treatment statuses in the individual treatment Z. Um, again, th this, this may resonate if, if, if you've been in the details of this corner of the, of the, of the literature. I actually think that the, the biggest implications of this will come from when we start to extend these ideas to time bearing treatments, which is something that, that we're working on. But I did just wanna mention this. So just to kind of summarize where we've come with the potential outcomes, we started to say, at least when we write them this way, to say that in the bipartite setting, there are two times two to the J minus one or two to the J different potential outcomes defined for every IJ pair, I being the outcome units, J being the interventional units we focused on a subset of those corresponding to the key associated treatment. And so that got us down to two times two to the J minus one defined for every I, no longer defined for every IJ pair. So we said, well, we're really only interested in these ones. And then this combination of defining the upwind treatment and making this interference assumption that we've made gets us down to the sort of more, much more tractable, tractable problem here where we say there's two times the number of levels of G uh, defined for every outcome unit. And then we can start to much more easily think about, define and think about causal estimates um, that might seem a little bit familiar. So one of them, again, would be something like the uh, direct effect. Um, so like the direct effect of treating the key associated plant while holding fixed the, all the upwind treatments. That's what's denoted here, where I've highlighted in blue what's changing between the sides of this expression here. It's, it's the uh, average effect of treating versus not treating the key associated plant while holding the upwind treatment rate fixed at some level G. And we could average this thing over the distribution of G to get some notion of the overall um, kind of average direct effect. So this we can think of interpreting along the lines of saying the average effect on IHD hospitalizations of installing a scrubber on the key associated power plant. And then we can think of something more like an indirect or spillover effect defined like this, where we say for a given value of Z, lowercase z, um, indicating the, the treatment of the key associated power plant, we can estimate the average causal effect 
of the upwind treatment rate being G versus being zero. Doesn't have to be zero there, but that's what we've uh, written down and, and, and summarized. Um, and similarly, we could average this quantity for a given level of Z over the distribution of G to get something like that we can think of as sort of the average effect on ischemic heart disease hospitalization is hospitalizations of installing more scrubbers on upwind plants. So I'll pause there and then outline one strategy for estimation of, of these things in case people have questions. Sure, so we have a question from uh, Nathan Josephs. It, it says, uh, how are interventions determined or allocated? Are they federally mandated or can the individuals in a given zip code influence the treatment status of their influential power plants, for example, through voting? That's a really great question. So it is, um, they are not federally mandated exactly. So we're talking about a time period where they are encouraged by federal regulation. Sometimes state governments lean on power companies to do this. There was a cap and trade program uh, implemented at least during the period of this study, which meant um, power plants could choose to invest in this intervention technology, get credits and then sell them where they can make a different situation to not invest in the technology um, and then buy credits. So it is a very complicated set of circumstances that lead to an individual power plant to decide, you know, the, the owner of the power plant ultimately decides whether to put the intervention in or not. It is a, a, a very sort of complicated set of decisions that lead to that. Sometimes that decision might be based on knowledge of the downwind populations. So I think that the question mentioned voting, like I'm not sure it exactly works that way, but sometimes the decisions to put a plant here versus not is based on knowledge of which populations are gonna be breathing the air downstream. And that has to do with how the kind of regulatory system flows from the federal government in the US to the state government who have to comply with various other rules and may say, oh, we know the pollution is bad in Philadelphia and we know that this power company owns this power plant that's making the pollution bad in Philadelphia, so they may lean on the owner of that power plant to install a scrubber. So I don't have a really succinct answer to that, but hopefully that gives you some sense of the sort of factors that influence the decisions of who gets these scrubbers and who doesn't. It may also be a purely economic decision on the part of the owner of the power plant. Great, thanks. Yeah, that's very useful. Um, you have about uh, 10 minutes left. Okay, great. Yeah. So let me quickly outline um, one strategy for estimation, then I'll show you what happens when we do this. So the estimation here is mostly uh, an extension of work that Laura and Fabrizia and, and, and Edo did uh, in their recent paper, which is to rely on estimation of, of what we call a joint or what they call a joint propensity score, which is just to say we have this bivariate treatment indicated by Z and G. And we're going to write a model for this joint propensity score decomposed into a propensity score for the individual level treatment and a propensity score for the upwind treatment conditional on the individual level treatment. And I will, I'll, I'll kind of breeze through the details here, um, uh, but pause for a moment on the confounding specification here, which I think relates to the question that was, that was just asked, is there is an assumption of ignorable treatment assignment here. It's an ignorable treatment assignment of both the individual and upwind treatment rate. And this, generally speaking, this sort of what you need to condition on to believe this type of assumption is going to include features of the location like population demographics or weather at that location, um, but also features of the upwind power plants. So we have this issue where the ignorability assumption is gonna depend on features of the power plants and features of, of the interventional units and features of the outcome units. And listed on the slide here are some examples of um, the types of features we had measured in, in this study. Weather and population demographics, mostly at the zip codes, and then features of the power plant, like its size, how much it's operating, what regulatory programs it participates in, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I, I'll breeze through an outline of the um, estimation strategy, but it, it's it, at this point, it's not all that different from how you, know, you, you might've seen propensity scores implemented elsewhere. Um, so we estimate this first component of the key associated propensity score um, for every zip code. And then we stratify all the zip codes into, in this case, K strata based on that estimated propensity score. 
Then within those strata of the individual level propensity score, we estimate this upwind propensity score for the upwind treatment G. And then we estimate a, a pretty simple parametric dose response function of the ischemic heart disease rate as a function of the treatments and this upwind propensity score and other covariates um, in that um, parametric regression model. But with the estimates from this type of regression model in hand, essentially we can predict potential outcomes under any combination of Z and G. That's the, that's the basic idea, idea. And we do this across a grid of, of G. Um, and then uh, with predictions of those uh, potential outcomes under the different combinations of the bivariate treatment in hand, we can, uh, in a fairly straightforward way, estimate those direct and upwind effects, uh, tau and delta, um, that I outlined previously. Standard error here is a lot more complicated, as, as you can probably guess. And so what, what we've done here in this paper is we just lifted this egocentric bootstrap um, from Laura and Fabrizia's earlier work, sort of noting that it's, it's not exactly right for this sampling mechanism. So this is um, an area where there's, I think, some work to do to sort out what might, what might work better. Um, but that's what we've done so far. And so I'll just give a quick uh, illustration of what this actually looked like when we, when we did it in this ischemic heart disease analysis. So here we actually had 472 coal-fired power plants that were operating in 2005. And we want to know how scrubbers are on the, some of those power plants affected Medicare hospitalization uh, for ischemic heart disease in that year at these about 24,000 zip codes. Uh, these are the zip codes where it was judged that um, coal-fired power plant pollution is actually sort of an important component of the pollution. Like there are very few, oops, sorry, coal-fired power plants. There are no, in 2005, there are no coal-fired power plants in California, for example. So coal-fired power pollution, coal-fired power plant pollution doesn't make a lot of sense in this, these like sort of big white swaths of the country. So that's the, the basic problem, just to give you an idea how this treatment definition sorted out. So here we have all of these zip codes colored in yellow here um, are zip codes where the key associated power plant had a scrubber installed during this year. So that'll give you uh, a sense uh, of what that looks like. And then here's a map of this upwind um, treatment, this sort of high ads weighted average of scrubbers located at upwind plants. Um, again, just to sort of fix ideas of what this all uh, what this all looks like when we do it. And so here are estimates of these average dose response curves. So I can kind of walk us through that and then I think we're, we're basically done. So what we have here uh, on the left and the right are dose response functions between the level of upwind treatment on the x-axis separated between the case where the key associated power plant does not have a scrubber and when the key associated power plant does have a scrubber. So the, the sort of main takeaways here is that both of these panels are sort of downward sloping, except for out here where we end up with a lot of un uncertainty. Um, and so a downward slope here indicates that more scrubbers upwind mean less ischemic heart disease hospitalization. So that's the um, upwind treatment effect, sort of like the indirect effect. And then the fact that this curve on the right side corresponding to when Z is equal to one is tends to be below this curve over here. That means there's a the evidence of a direct effect uh, where having a, 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 zip, a scrubber at the key associated power plant leads to less ischemic heart disease hospitalizations. He, here's what the actual estimates look like numerically. So the average direct effect of installing a scrubber on the key power plant is a reduction of about eight hospitalizations per 10,000 person years. Um, and the average upwind effect, you know, sort of depends on whether the key associated power plant is treated or not, but we get, um, these estimates of about minus 30, minus 15, um, fewer hospitalizations per 10,000 person years for having more scrubbers upwind versus uh, zero, uh, zero scrubbers upwind. So I'll just stop there to say that we have this sort of problem where we're interested in causal inference with some explicitly spatial data, in which case I think when you find yourself in that situation, you, you, you will often be confronting notions of interference or spillover. Um, through this work, we introduced some new types of causal uh, questions and sort of, I think, added a, a little bit of a, a dimension over where the research sits on net social networks and infectious diseases and other things that can be easily cast as social networks. Um, 
there's not a lot in this literature. There's some now, um, thankfully, but there's not a lot of literature here on data that are spatial per se. And so I think this is sort of an installment of that type of problem. Uh, hopefully I've convinced you that there's a clear role of this type of methodology in the study of air quality interventions and give sort of one instance of combining some statistical methods here with some, some atmospheric science uh, atmospheric science tools. Um, there's this distinction here between this notion of interference because of complex exposure patterns versus what I think is the more often considered setting of, of unit to unit outcome dependencies, which I think is important. Um, and all this added up to some methods for bipartite causal inference with interference. Um, again, very closely tailored in this case to these studies of power plants, but, but are, are sort of finding relevance in other interventions where the impacts kind of diffuse across networks according to some sort of physical or geographic um, process. And I'll stop there. I'll, I'll acknowledge uh, a lot of collaborators here, in particular Laura and Fabrizia who are on the line, who are close collaborators on, on the uh, basically the last third of the talk and some of the other pieces. And here are some references listed here in the funding sources. So thanks, everybody. Uh, thanks, Corwin. Uh, so maybe before we get to the discussion, we'll just take a quick question or two. So first, we have a question from uh, Ming Hao, who I will unmute. Ming Hao, uh, thanks. Are you there? Oh, there you are. Yes. Uh, thanks. My question is, um, uh, in the early part of the presentation, you talked about the data-driven statistical approaches to quantify the interference structure. Uh, I know you said it's in the ongoing work, but I'm wondering if you can talk a little more on what you see as the biggest challenges for this approach. Is this the data we have on air quality or meteorology is not fine enough in its temporal spatial resolution, or it's something related to the architecture of the machine learning, like CNN yeah. cannot predict air pollution transport or something like that. Thanks. This is not fair, Ming Hao. I didn't know there were gonna be atmospheric engineers on the call to combat my statement that they'll think I'm crazy for trying to do this with statistics. Um, but thank you, no, that's a really great question. Uh, I, I don't think there's one answer to what's so complicated about it. I think that, um, the, the, I think that the, the best I can say is that there is a lot of spatial dependence obviously in this type of problem. And, and you would want to kind of leverage that in order to do a good job, um, which is not always straightforward from a sort of purely statistical standpoint. And then when it comes to methods that are trying to relate emissions to at power plants to um, air pollution, there's a lot of sort of seasonal confounding, basically. These are very seasonal phenomena. Ming Hao understands better than I do why they're seasonal phenomena, but they can be very difficult to kind of tease apart, um, to tease apart if you're trying to identify this sort of like individual source receptor link to say, no, it's this power plant that's impacting that location and not that other one. Um, so I would say it's, it is kind of typical notions of, um, uh, I don't think it's a limitation of like the meteorology data, for example, which I think is something you mentioned. I think it's more just about very strong spatial and temporal dependence that makes it very, it makes it very difficult to tease apart these individual links between power plants and locations. And I should, I'll add that both of those statistical approaches I alluded to, they insert some physics knowledge into the way those models are specified. I don't, I don't know that there's a way to get completely away from what's known about the physics or the chemistry here. Uh, well, thanks so much for uh, the great talk. I think we're going to move to the discussion now. So, uh, Forrest, if you're ready to uh, begin, you can share, or I guess, uh, Corey, maybe stop sharing your screen. Oh, yeah, sorry. All right. Okay, you can see my, my slides. Yes. Great. Uh, thank you. Um, thanks to Corey and uh, Laura and Fabrizia. Um, it's a very nice talk and I really enjoyed the paper. It's an incredibly clear paper, I think, in terms of the exposition, the description of the scientific problem, um, the notation and the methodology and the findings. Um, so I'm not going to summarize it uh, here. Uh, instead, I'll try to um, give you, I guess, a broad uh, conceptual uh, perspective or how I think about these things. Um, 
and describe how I think the paper engages with the topics of interference more broadly um, and this idea of exposure mappings and where those weird things come from. So we'll talk a little bit about interference and what bipartite causal inference or what I think it means uh, in this context uh, about domain knowledge, exclusion restrictions and where exposure mappings come from scientifically and then um, how we construct estimates using that sort of information and when we marginalize or write expectations over uh, potential outcomes or over exposures in this case um, with respect to what distribution do we marginalize. Um, so I think that uh, we're blessed with pretty good potential outcome notation uh, for interference. It's generic enough to accommodate almost any meaning that we wish to assign to an intervention argument. Um, so in this case, for an outcome unit J, we can write the potential outcome as YJ of S, where S might be a vector um, of treatments or, or interventions given to the units on which we observe the outcomes. It could be other units, as they are in this paper. It could be something completely different, like a continuous function of space or time. Um, so this is really appealing, and it, and it, I think, is an invitation for us to broaden what we mean by interference. Um, when we think about uh, how we want to index potential outcomes on the units uh, whose outcomes we care most about. Um, interference in this context is represented by a weighted bipartite graph that says how interventions on some treatment units that might affect other uh, outcome units. And, and I think it's interference in this case because uh, the unintervention on one power plant can affect multiple outcome units. And then the usual partial interference assumptions or exclusion restrictions on how uh, treatments to other units can affect a focal unit, um, we can sort of think of those things as threshold operations on a, uh, an interference network or graph. Um, so I think this is a very useful perspective and, and an invitation to broaden what we mean by interference. Um, completely non-parametric causal inference in non-randomized settings or even in randomized settings is pretty hard um, because of the space of potential outcomes uh, that are indexed by the vector of joint treatments. Um, so people often use structural or parametric assumptions to reduce the space of distinct potential outcomes. And I remember thinking about this uh, when I first read Peter Arano and Cyrus Sammy's uh, paper uh, from 2017, um, and they used this term exposure mappings, which I felt sort of generalized uh, earlier ideas um, uh, about partial interference. Uh, most work in causal inference under interference assumes the existence of such a mapping, and usually it's it's uh, sort of given in the problem. Um, but I think it's worth thinking about in this context where it comes from, and in this case, it comes from very deep domain knowledge and real scientific inferences, um, not naive statistical inferences necessarily, but uh, but real atmospheric models that are tailored to the problem. Um, and I think this is also a, another invitation for us to think carefully about where our exposure mappings come from in interference problem, in interference problems, and ask how auxiliary scientific domain knowledge can be used to construct them. Usually it is not possible to learn about an exposure mapping at the same time as you learn about causal effects in a given system. That study and inference of an exposure mapping needs to come from separate scientific work. Um, I've never known what other people mean by the word interference. Uh, to me, it has always seemed unclear. And I think this paper offers a chance for us to see how rigorous empirical research should define it. You probably know that when people say interference, they mean all sorts of things. Sometimes they mean mere phenomenological dependence in treatments. Sometimes they mean group level treatments. Sometimes they mean spillover uh, dependency of outcomes on other people's treatments or other units treatments. Sometimes they mean com something completely different the dependency of outcomes on other people's or other units outcomes, which I think of as contagion, which might or might not be the same thing as interference. If there's a single broad lesson that I would draw from this work, it is that defining meaningful causal estimates and identifying them really requires structural knowledge uh, about the problem, especially when there's not a, a easy mapping between intervention and outcome units. And, uh, you know, sometimes we criticize uh, statistical work that imposes parametric or structural assumptions to I obtain identification. Um, but this is one of those situations where those assumptions actually aren't really assumptions, they're inferences that come from the scientific domain work. The last thing I'll say is, is just, um, just to uh, 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 mention about the estimates that are constructed here. Uh, the direct effect and indirect effect are, are defined perhaps in, in exactly the way that um, you would like them to be. They hold uh, exposure or the upwind treatment uh, 
uh, exposure constant within um, within strata. Uh, so each element of the sum end in the direct effect tau and the indirect effect um, delta holds uh, constant. Well, the the tau holds constant uh, g, and these these con these contrasts here I think have a causal interpretation in this context as direct effects and indirect effects, because the marginalizing distribution over g is invariant to the value of z. Um, and there are other ways of defining uh, direct effects, but here I think um, this is exactly what we want. And indeed, I think any contrast uh, for the direct effect, any contrast of potential outcomes marginalized with respect to any distribution over G that is invariant to Z has an interpretation as a direct effect under some exposure circumstance that is specified by the probability distribution of G. So I like the way, in other words, I, I like the way that the uh, direct effect and indirect effect are defined here. I'll close with a couple of questions uh, that came to me when I was reading the paper and listening to the talk. Uh, the first is is about um, the exposure maps and uh, and weighted upwind treatments. I, it was unclear to me whether the weights needed to sum to one uh, or whether it is absolute exposure to pollution or the effects of interventions on other units that is that matters. There were several questions from the audience on this idea of probabilistic exposure mappings, that there is uncertainty in um, the upwind uh, exposure. So I'm curious about that and whether we can just think of your deterministic exposure map as the expectation of a stochastic exposure. Um, time dependence and treatments. Uh, we didn't, you didn't use the word um, uh, endogenous, uh, but, but I'm curious about whether there are t changing um, treatments applied to power plants that are a result of prior outcomes in time. And then uh, last question, why give special status to a single key associated plant and not treat them all on equal footing under the given exposure mapping which it seems that you've learned quite a lot about. Uh, so that's all I have to say. Thanks very much. And I'll turn it back over to Corey and co-authors. So should I say a couple of things in response here? Sure, yeah. That's where we are at this point in the program. Uh, thanks, Forrest. No, I appreciate I appreciate the, the thoughts and the discussion. Um, in particular, what you said about, you know, things that we as statistician, statisticians are often used to thinking of as assumptions that are really inferences that are output from some other domain. I mean, I think that there's a lot of, I mean, my sort of opinion is there's a lot of work for sort of statistics to work under that type of paradigm, um, certainly in air pollution, but in lots of other um, areas too. So I'm, I'm really pleased you mentioned that. Um, in terms of the specific questions you raised, if I can try and remember them, um, uh, I think that we are looking at the exposure mapping here sort of as an average of what happens over time. Um, like, an expect, like an expected exposure map over the years is, is sort of close to what we've defined here. Um, when in truth, it is a very seasonally varying uh, process. And so that's sort of what we're trying to think about now. Um, I'm trying to remember the other questions you put up at the on the screen. Oh, the the and it, along the lines of that temporal vari variation and the endogeneity. Um, it, it I don't know that I know this that I've concluded this for myself for sure. But when you think about variability over time, the de the decisions to put power plants in or not don't happen that fast. And once a once a power uh, sorry to put scrubbers in or not don't happen that fast. And once a scrubber is in, it doesn't come off. And so what we have, at least in the US over time, is there's not, there, there's, there's never sort of a period where there are a bunch of scrubbers going on at different points of the year. That's sort of like a fairly rare event. And so the variation in treatments here comes from this G, the wind basically. And then we can think about if we're looking at this over time, how far can we get on the rationale that, well, the wind is blowing in some way that nobody's controlling. So, um, do we have an argument for exogeneity over time? Um, and so those are the things that, you know, I think I'm trying to convince myself of now, but they're very, very key components of this problem that are kind of papered over by looking at this one kind of cross-sectional average over a year. Um, I'll let Fabrizio or Laura say anything if, if they want. Um, 
I'll, I'll keep going too. I mean, you mentioned why the focus on the key associated power plant. I mean, I think that that's a good question. I mean, the, the, the lazy answer is that like it was easy to make progress with an estimation strategy um, under that assumption. I think that we have done some thinking and some of this is in a different paper about, could you be estimating sort of um, something more, uh, a, a causal estimate that's indexed by a particular power plant, something more like that would more closely map to what's the causal effect of treating this power plant accounting for the fact that that treatment kind of spills over. Um, so we've thought a little bit about how you might go about defining average estimates that look like that, but I'm not sure we really, we've really made any real progress on estimation in that in thinking about those types of things. Okay, thanks. Um, maybe we take- Sorry, Corey, I was busy trying to writing. <laughs> responses oh. to some of the questions so that's why that's okay <laughs> but anyway I so um, I verified most of the questions so. okay maybe we can squeeze in one more question from the audience so I think Eric uh, Chechen Chechen had a question and a follow-up so I'll uh, unmute him if he's still here thank you Michael thanks Corey um, for a great talk and and for us for a great discussion. My, my question is a little tangential um, to, to your presentation. It's something that you, you repurpose from a prior paper, which was um, my concern about the, the modeling of the propensity score, because my concern is that, and Fabricia addressed this partially, is that there may not exist an uh, actual data genome mechanism such that all the propensity score are compatible with each other. And in which case, it doesn't matter how you use the propensity score, you're gonna get bias estimate. And that's because the model is so complicated in, in the way you describe the outcomes of the propensity score and the conditioning event overlap, can overlap across outcome units. Um, so my question is actually more of a practical question. Um, this is a hard problem. So I, how, do you have ways of diagnosing the extent to which this might be an issue in practice? So I'm not sure I completely understand, Eric. So it sounds like, well, tell me if this is an, a characterization of what you're asking. I mean, you can estimate, you can write down these models like we have, and you get these quantities you're calling the estimated propensity scores. But in reality, there are combinations of those values that are not compatible with the actual joint distribution of how these two things we're calling treatments arise. And um, is this something that, could be diagnosed by basically looking at what we like to think of as notions of overlap, but not just overlap in covariates. You've got to think about whether there's representation across this range of G within a certain level of Z, for example. I don't know if that's what you're um, asking exactly, Eric, but I'd say that this is one of the very has been one of the very difficult and delicate parts of the implementation here because you have this very these very oddly correlated treatments. And so you have this very weird distribution of both the individual treatment, this upwind treatment, and then the distribution of those corresponding propensity scores. And um, so do I have yeah. a way? There are some ways that we've done to kind of basically diagnose whether they're like we should only be confining inference to some certain regions of this joint distribution, but. Um, okay, anyway. no, that, that addresses my, my question. Thank you so much. I mean, but I think that you are right to have identified that as like, it's a real pressure point for actually doing this. If you wanna take a data set and estimate these things, that is a real pressure point um, in terms of the specification of how you use the propensity score, reliance on parametric assumptions, things like that. I think Fabrizio had something to add. No, I, I thought that Eric's um, concern was more that uh, the propensity scores that we estimate and use should come from a, uh, and be consistent with a joint uh, distribution of all the Zs and the Gs, right? And because we essentially specify the propensity score, the joint propensity scores for um, the outcome units, 
these, of course, may create uh, incompatible, uh, let's say, distributions of the Zs and the Gs uh, that are not compatible in that they give, they give not rise to a proper joint distribution. And in, and in my response, I essentially said that it is, this is not in principle a major issues in that uh, under the stated uh, unconfoundedness assumptions, what we need is the uh, propensity score at the outcome unit level, that it's a balancing score. Uh, and with that, we, we try to derive a, um, an estimator of uh, the quantity of interest. So yes, of course, this is all an approximation of, uh, again, of what the true uh, data generating process is, but I don't think uh, that we really need uh, something that it's consistent with the joint distributions of all these Gs and Cs, but I may be wrong. So I, I don't want to dwell on this too much. We can follow up offline, but let me just say one thing, which is if the models are not compatible, they cannot be consistent and you cannot get on bias estimation. Um, so even if you don't care about the joint distribution, if the, the models for the margins that you're specifying do not agree with it, doesn't exist a joint distribution, they cannot be true models. And so I, I do think it's- But they, they should be consistent with respect to the propensity score for the outcome, for that specific outcome uh, unit, right? Yeah, sorry, Eric, when you say not consistent, you mean consistent with the true joint distribution of what? Yeah, that the, is the what I mean, like. Z and G, which is what we're, which, I mean, this is maybe not productive to do right now, but, um, but it, can you, you mean consistent yeah, with I can, joint I can, distribution I can, I can. of scrubbers and this upwind treatment rate? No, sorry. Yeah, it's hard to do on the phone. So if, if you just have two variables, Z1 and Z2, and you have margins of Z1 given X and Z2 given X, but there doesn't exist a joint distribution of Z1 and Z2 given X that agrees with those two margins, then your models are by definition misspecified. And so this is a more complicated version of that, where you have the joint Z and G for each outcome, you have a different propensity score for each outcome, but there's an overlap between them. And so if, the, if you're not sure that it, they, can, they exist a joint distribution of all the treatments, conditional on all the covariates, the models by definition have to be specified. And we can, we can really follow up uh, by email or, or offline because I, I don't think we need to hold everyone back. Yeah, I'm gonna send you an email, Eric. I think we do have a joint distribution, but, but anyway, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. I'll just quickly wrap up. Um, yeah, thank you so much, uh, Corey, for a very nice uh, talk. And also thank you, uh, Forrest, for, for a great uh, discussion. Also, thank you, Laura and Fabri, for, uh, for rocking Q&A today. Next time, we'll have Ramesh Yohari. who will talk about experimental design in two-sided platforms and analysis of bias. Thank you all for coming. Uh, have a great week and see you next time. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.